Uh, so I received my first Kickstarter backed thing in the mail today and I'm, I want to love it, but it's quasi DOA. So I got the nifty mini drive. Did you guys remember this from like eight months ago? Or something so. Yeah. Like it's, that. it's like, was it like the USB drive that fits in the uh, SD card slot? Yeah, basically. So what it, the premise is it fits in the SD card slot of, of a Mac and they've, designed it and machined it in such a way that you stick this into the slot and stick, I think it's a micro SD uh, card into the nifty mini drive. And then you put the mini drive in the SD card slot for your Mac. And then it sits flush as opposed to the way full size SD cards typically sit. And so you've basically added another drive to your Mac, which I don't know why I wanted to do this other than it seemed cool. And now that I've gotten it, 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 it looks great. It, it is. It looks to be the same aluminum that that that's that the Mac is made of. I didn't get a color. I just got it in plain aluminum, and I really like the look of it. But apparently, some tolerance or something was a little bit off in some of the first batches, and so without putting uh, scotch or cello tape around it, the drive was read only. <laughs> so I had to put what? scotch tape around it because SD cards have a physical switch to make them read only. And oh. so apparently, yeah. So apparently, without scotch tape around it, it w- it didn't trip or did trip whichever direction the switch that made the that made OS X treat it as read only. So now I have scotch tape around it. But other than that, it's actually really cool. So I was just curious. Let, let me just let me just clarify. So you took something from somebody who's never made anything before that's made to sit flush inside of a delicate tiny slot in your expensive computer, then added tape to it. And put that in the delicate slot in your expensive yes. computer. You are exactly right. That clearly nothing bad will happen. <laughs> I'm looking at this video and they're taking like the little sand disc label and using it as a shim inside the thing to did you see this in the video? I'm assuming you did. Um, they're they're saying take the little carrier, take your little card that's inside it, but then they shove the little piece of paper or plastic uh, like uh, it, underneath it to try to shim it to shift it around inside the thing. Is that where you put the tape? No, I I just put the tape around the outside of it. Watch, watch the Kickstarter video. I don't uh-huh. have the audio on, but here. Go, go this seems like the kind of product where the better idea would be to wait until this thing got popular, wait till somebody else with manufacturing experience rips it off and just makes like a $7 version of it on Amazon and just buy that. Why would you buy this at all, though? Like, that's my... I don't understand that I don't Because it just seemed cool. How, I how have big no is the biggest like, just capacity you can, you can have in here? I have a 64 gig micro SD card, and that yeah, was it's not... super duper slow. It wasn't terrible. I mean, I put like five gigs of Top Gear on it, and it took like 10 minutes or something like that. I mean, it was not fast, without question, but it was not but terrible. You're, you're taking up your SD card slot. Like, what if you want to take things off a camera? Like, the whole point of it. Is- you assume I use a camera other than our phones. <sighs> well, I mean, my, I, have, I have this new small camera, and it, it has SD cards, but I never take them out because it, uh, it charges over USB, which is an awesome feature of a camera. Uh, and so... I just plug it in via USB whenever I transfer so I can kind of top off the charge also. What camera is this? The uh, the ridiculous one, the Sony RX1. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm looking... At- that, charge, that charges over USB? It, not only does okay. that, I have, I have a Sony camcorder that we got when the baby was born. The camcorder charges over USB. It's awesome. It, I, I keep meaning to blog about this. It's one of the best features just for like... It's one of those little tiny conveniences that's just awesome. Yeah, because the charge. Char- well, so on, on the RX one, does it have a removable battery though? At least. Yeah, and and I have I have I got a second one because the battery life isn't that great if you're doing a whole bunch of viewing on the screen. Like you can only yeah. shoot like a couple hundred pictures before the battery goes. Um, and f- I, we only ever hit the battery being dead during shooting once, like because we just don't shoot that many at once. Um, but uh, it's a fantastic camera for so in so many ways. I was excited about that camera until I saw how much it costs. I'm like, oh, so it just costs as much as a regular camera. Yeah, it's the cost. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's insane. exciting. It's so small and it's still two grand. So never. It's mind. you know what, what's <laughs> what's crazy about this camera is that it is actually worth it. Like compared to the market, it is worth that price. I totally I mean, see yeah, why Sony you're, is charging you're, that. You're however, the miniaturization and everything. You yeah, know? but well, but yeah, like however, even though it is competitive with with its equals. It is still like you still feel like you shouldn't be paying this much for a camera this size, even though it's so great because it is that size and it is like it's it's so good, like the the image quality you get from both that ridiculously good sensor and the really really good optic in front of it, the, the quality you get of it, like it's it is better in many ways than my five D Mark II. 
Yeah, these cam- cameras are pissing me off still. It's kind <laughs> of like televisions are pissing me off for a long time because it's like, look, we, you know, I liked mirrorless. I'm like, okay, finally, we're making some freaking progress. We can stop with the flappy mirrors and the other stuff that was has its origins and optical things that are no longer a factor because we all have giant screens in the back of use. I was like, let me stop. All right. That will be, you know, I'm like, how long? This should be progressing like Moore's Law. I want a gigantic full frame sensor in a tiny little camera. The sensor is only like one inch square. Can we fit that in a small camera? Oh, it's, it's still two grand. I mean, come on, come on, faster, faster. Because you realize, like, this is one of those things where uh, it should be that, like, in five or ten years, the amazing Canon 5D, I should be able to get that in a little dinky thing. Like It seems like that should be the progression. It's maybe not a phone, but in a tiny little dinky handheld camera. But it's like, well, no, if you get a small camera, you get a sensor the size of, uh, you know, one-eighth of a postage stamp. So screw you. Like, no, put the big sensor in there. <laughs> well, I would do, say... It's still, it's still two grand. I guess it just... That's how much... I mean, it's ignoring almost three optics, grand. Uh, pres- it's it's 2800 <laughs> But, like... Yeah, but, you know... I mean, I think... The the RX one's biggest flaw or biggest downside. It, it's not really a flaw, I guess. It's it's more of just a downside of of, of the practicality of its design. Um, is that uh, the lens sticks out pretty far? Uh, just because I, I think it's just because if you want an f two point oh thirty five millimeter lens that can project enough of a of an image circle to cover a full frame sensor. Uh, yeah. It needs to be a certain size. Like you just can't. Like I don't think they could have made it that much smaller. And yeah, so the result is that the camera thing. is is fairly deep. So like it, you can't put it in a pocket of anything except like a big loose jacket pocket. Um, you get like one of those pancake lenses though that gives you like the weird you know fish eye appearance type thing. You know, like no, that you could but do. You're right though. Like the, well, the, the optical this. part of it is like is the intractable part because look if you're precision grinding glass and aligning the things with each other and like the nature of optics and the nature of glass is such that that is not i don't expect that to get cheap according to moore's law i but i do keep hoping that the sensor part of it should progress along the typical technology you know it's so like so i'm okay with like zoom lenses always being super expensive because it's like that they, they, they're not subject to moore's law or, or any of those things but the sensors i felt like the light, light gathering ability, at the very least, right. I want to see more progress than I have seen. So even though like my my Canon S one ten or whatever the hell I have for my little mini camera is amazing compared to like my first digital camera, it's not amazing enough. And so like the mirrorless movement, I thought we were going to move towards. Uh, so you don't want a giant SLR and you don't need this giant thing, but in these little tiny cameras, we're going to put much bigger sensors and give you a reasonable lens and try to cut down the price. Uh, but it seems like the RX one is the other direction. It's like, okay, for people who already have lots of money and are professional photographers, we can make them not have to carry such a big giant monster thing. But it's still going to cost, you know, whatever twenty eight hundred bucks, as you said. Yeah, and it's and it, like it isn't as portable as I want it to be. But I love using it. I just absolutely love using it. And it, like it, it has it has made my entire setup of Canon glass seem obsolete now. Even though the glass is great, like this this now feels like the new form factor. Of cameras, like I really don't see myself buying another SLR. Like I, I don't. I probably will. I'll probably go back on this like in three years or something. But no, you won't. That's the days of the SLRs are numbered with those yeah. stupid mirrors. It's like people are people going to be talking about that sound when I was a boy. We heard <laughs> this when we took a picture and we loved it. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah. Nice. I'm actually just excited. I, I I don't know anything about photography, and and I, I wish I did, but I've never had the time nor the money to to nor, figure nor it the out. children. Nor the children, that makes uh, you do it. but but I, I'm actually kind of happy to see Sony doing well again. I think John, you've talked about this at, at length in the past. But when I, when I was a kid, Sony was the brand. To, oh yeah, to, and and then the God, how the mighty fell. And to to hear you uh, espousing this camera so, so yeah, you know, with such enthusiasm, it's it, it's good to hear that Sony's doing. But well what happened? Again. Sony so, bought Sony Minolta. Was... And uh, and really became extremely serious about uh, camera stuff. Like I don't know, five six eight years ago something like that and uh they've been slowly progressing and and like they got into the slr business fairly recently like with the the a90 was the first one whatever the first one was they got into the slr business and and what's happening now for a while canon was was very clearly the leader in sensor technology and and for a while i think even even the lenses and and they're still doing very well in the lenses very close with nikon but still doing very very well um and but the Canon sensors have kind of slowed down in progress recently, and everyone else has caught up uh, very closely. And in many ways, by by almost all measurements, the new Sony sensors are better than Canon sensors. 
And yeah, Sony uh, used to be an, an embarrassment in the camera industry. I remember when yeah. I was first shopping for digital cameras, like, oh, it's Canon, it's Canon and Nikon, and Sony makes cameras too, but just ignore them because they're pieces of crap. Like, they don't know what they're yeah. doing with these digital cameras, right? Uh, and, and, and it's taken them a while to turn that around to be taken seriously as a player. Like, every time they'd be like, some amazing new Sony camera would have some aspect of it that was amazing, but all the rest of it would be crap, and you'd look at the pictures that you get taken with, and it would just be a mess. Even if it was just image processing or battery life or some weird ergonomic aspect that was screwed up because they wanted to make it <laughs> sleek. But it seems like they're finally figuring it out at long last. Oh, yeah. And so now that they're, they're carrying forward their strengths that they had in the electronic stuff, and, you know, they figured out all the other stuff that, you know, it, it, it kind of makes me wish that Apple made a camera because even all these cameras, like now that now that the whole back of them is a screen and a lot of it is the UI and these camera makers have no idea how to make a user interface oh, yeah. to save their lives. The UIs are terrible. Yeah. It's, I really, you know, they could need some help there. Uh, the good thing that saving cameras is though is I think like car dashboards, uh, there will always be a place, especially in professional cameras for knobs, dials and buttons because you can use them that you can, get to them without looking and it's much easier using a touch screen and doesn't mean you don't also expose that in a touch screen but uh the camera makers who are good at the shutter button the knobs the dials the twisty things that will, will that skill will not become obsolete it won't be like oh well you used to be good at those knobs and twisty things but now you don't need them at all anymore no you'll you'll always want them on a camera and that's why apple that's, shouldn't make one uh, yeah because they'll <laughs> no removable battery uh they, no apple buttons, would make one with no buttons screen. and it would be a, yeah. everything would be on the screen it'd be a pain in the ass to use yeah, it might be okay for a casual camera. Like, we're just talking about, you know, like, you know, people who are into photography. Well, that's the problem, for a casual though. camera, like, that's why people love the iPhone. That's all they want. Right. It's a big screen that you point at something and you say, what on screen now make a picture of? The problem is that the market the... for casual cameras is evaporating. I mean, it's... Well, you know, that's the phone market. Like, I mean, basically, right. you could say Apple has entered the market with the iPhone, and that's, that's you know, that's the right. market. Like, that's what they're doing. Apple but... has entered the, f- the camera market the same way they entered the video game platform market, kind of accidentally. <sighs> And then, yeah. and once they realized they were doing it, they really took advantage of it. Apple's still not really in the video game market. Uh, I don't know. Uh, how well is that Wii U selling? Uh, I know. I, I'm <laughs> saying that they're 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 in their own market, making their own things. Like they're they'll never be in the gaming market until they decide they want to make a, a machine focused on games, and they're they're not going to do that because it's not what they do. Well, so. I think they have made a machine made machines. No, it doesn't, on it games. doesn't have any buttons on it. It's it's the same thing. It's like it's like trying to make a you know a car dashboard, but there's no steering wheel. You steer by dragging your finger on the screen. It's fine. <laughs> you could put a virtual steering wheel on the screen and drag that with your finger. It'll be yeah. You know, they you know they they're not going to do that. They're never going to put something on an iPhone that ugs it up just for the purposes of games. So the um, the type and of games that you can put on an entirely touchscreen device with really no buttons to speak of that you can use for gaming is so incredibly limited. Well, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're doing a typical uh, disruption move of, of not attacking head-on uh, into that market. They're, they're kind of running this parallel thing on the side that is taking a lot of that market away without doing exactly the same thing. Because if they tried doing no, exactly no, the same thing, they would have a lot doing, harder time. They're doing a blue ocean thing. They're going for the people who were never going to buy those crazy game machines, right? And that's why they're selling a bazillion copies and making tons more money. And, but they're not, they're, they're not going after the people who want to play uh, you know, games that can't be played on a touchscreen. Apple's not interested. Like, if Apple's interested in taking the gaming market, they would make something that can play games that can't be played on a touchscreen. But they're not interested in the gaming market. They'll just take what they can get from what they are interested in. Uh, it, but they're making more money than everyone else because it turns out there's way more people who who don't care about uh, games that can't be played on a touchscreen. Because basically, touchscreen games alone are too complicated for most people. It's just like, oh, it's a touchscreen game, but it's simple. You'll like it. You just pull back the little bird and you let them go. Like, you know, it's, right. well, they've people can handle. They provided. Be they've made an alternative. Like before, if you wanted to play a game. Um, you had, you know, you've always had the consoles and the high end PCs doing these kind of, you know, these A rated games, these big, major, big budget, complex things, these awesome graphics and everything. And you've always had the market for casual games. Um, you know, in the old days, casual games were those those CD ROMs at Walmart full of ten thousand solitaire variants. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, and and then br- for a while, they were like flash games on the web, and, and there are still some of that, but. But now uh, you're seeing this massive boom. Oh, and like for six months they were on Facebook, and now you're seeing this massive boom. Uh, they're still on Facebook. Of, uh, like Microsoft owned owned the casual game market in the '90s because the the casual game market was dominated by Minesweeper and Solitaire, the two most 
popu- oh, most yeah. played games by humans <laughs> in the entire history of the universe because everyone had a PC on their desk in the 90s and all they did all day was play Minesweeper and Solitaire. Too bad they didn't charge money for that. Don't those, forget but, Free like, Cell. They, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's true. It's an untapped market, but like that's just, just <laughs> the equivalent. Everyone has cell phones now and everyone plays games in them, but Apple was smart enough to actually make a market. And imagine if the iPhone just came with three games. And well, well, there was no app store. But, People would play those three games so much. But the difference <laughs> now, though, the difference now is that they have this massive game library on these casual devices. Casual gaming has never been better than it is today. It's all, and it gets better all the time. And that more and, and Apple really owns quite a big portion of, of casual gaming. And that's why they're attacking big gaming because casual gaming in general is now way bigger, way easier, and way more rich than it was before in content availability. Yeah. And, the, and so now, like, whereas before, I think a lot of people would get tired of those casual games and go buy an Xbox if they wanted to play games at night, now you're seeing a lot more people who are sticking with the world of casual games instead of buying a game console. Yeah, but, but if Apple's just not willing to make it possible to play games that aren't playable on a touch screen they're never gonna they're never gonna pull that market it's like it's like someone who's trying to say i'm gonna make a thing and it's like a movie but it's on a little tiny box that's in your home and way more people are gonna have it uh and, and like saying okay well are you ever gonna do a thing where the picture is the size of the side of the building no no it's always gonna be small in the home like it can't really be taller than one story because people's ceilings are like eight feet high so we're really not you know there will always be a market for movies because the screen is way bigger and it's a different experience. And I mean, this is not as ridiculous in terms of square, square footage or whatever, but there's just certain types of games that people like to play that you can't play with touchscreen controls. And if Apple is never, 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 never going to go after them, there's always going to like, they're saying, we don't, we don't want that. You can do something else. And it just so happens that the games that you can't play with touchscreen controls are like the traditional genres that are way deeper that most people can't play at all. Uh, but there is a proven market for, uh, is there enough of a market for four or three console competitors? Probably not. So say goodbye to some of them, right? You know, but I still, I still think that if Apple refuses to go to that, it's not like there's a future where all gaming is touchscreen gaming. That just oh, does no, not exist. Oh no, definitely not. Because, but I, you know, you know just so, like the, just like there's no future where movie theaters are totally gone. But I think it's very easy to see that game consoles are, and are getting really marginalized, just like movie theaters. I mean, it's it's a it's consolidation. Like they, there's probably not enough of a market left for all the players that are there to be doing what they're doing. So there's going to be some sort of consolidation that goes on there. But it, like the fact that Apple is so hands off with the games, like they're not even. It's not even to the point where I mean, maybe you should talk to some Apple evangelists about this. But like, so that they're competing in theory with Android for the casual game dollar. Like, so you want to make a you know Sally Spa type game. Uh, the console makers in that market are so mature that, you know, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, Sega, like all those people back in the day uh, would go to the popular third party developers like EA or whoever and court them and say, you should really make your next great Sally Spa game for our platform. And here's why. And like and cater to them and just like go after them because they're competing for the content creation talent. Uh, is Apple going out and trying to to get EA to make casual games for them and not for Android? No, because they're just like EA will make games for us. We, you know, we're the only people who have paying customers. So you know, like we got it in the bag. Like the market hasn't matured to the point where it's even to the level where the console market was in the '80s, where you know I don't believe Apple is believes in games. Like they like the fact that games that are on their platform, but they are not going to do anything for those people with the games except okay, we'll put a good GPU for you in there. But like oh, could you put like buttons and a joystick or have an officially supported blue like even just Bluetooth? It's like something, anything. Throw us a bone. Let us have a controller. They're like no, we'd rather not. You we'd rather you not muck up our thing with any sort of traditional video game controller. Can't you just make your game touch screen? Really, we feel like your game should conform to our interface this is our vision for the phone or whatever and they're like oh, all right that's where the money is let's make a million of these games for a dollar each or whatever I, I just don't feel like apple believes in understands or is interested in gaming they just you know take what they can get well i think you're right about that for the most part but do you honestly think that a game released for ios would sell very well if it costs like more than a dollar and required a 30 dollar joystick well, like that's that's how if they ever wanted to go after the rest of that market, you take your iPad Pro in 2020, right, and you have an officially supported Bluetooth controller interface for it, or some sort of uh, attachment that snaps into the Lightning connector on your phone or whatever, and turns it into a game machine. And suddenly, now you the, the rest of the market is in real trouble because they're saying we're not going to leave a portion of the game market for you. We're taking all the monies from all the casual games and even that niche market for just people who want more sophisticated games. We're going to take that too because guess what? We have official support. 
for games that you play that do not require you to touch the screen. And then everyone else is doomed. But Apple thus far has been like, no, just just stick to the touch screen. Like, that's our thing. It's simple. If you feel like you can't make a certain type of game you can't make with a touch screen, tough luck. Make, don't, then don't do it then, right? Yeah, but that's, I mean, as a user, I kind of like that. Like, I, as a user, as a, yeah, as a casual I'm not saying it's the wrong gamer. strategy for Apple, but I, I'm just saying, like, it's, it, it doesn't show me that they're really, really into gaming. Because they're not, they're not trying to say what kind of interactive gaming experiences can we have. Let's make it like Nintendo is into gaming. Nintendo is like, right. what can we make to do something new in in gaming? And we don't care what we have to make—a crazy waggly remote, a second screen, like you know, like whatever. We, we just tr- try to think of something. Except easy uh, online play. Well, they would do that. <laughs> they would do that if they could. That's, that's a competence <laughs> issue, I believe. Not really a. They would like that to happen if you could sprinkle the fairy dust and make it happen. But, but like they, you know, their whole company is focused on what can we make uh, to make to, to push the frontiers of gaming, and Apple is just not doing that at all, not even close. You know, to go back a little bit, I have to disagree that sol- well, maybe not disagree, but point out that maybe Solitaire is not the most uh, widely played game ever because. I can tell you when I had a Nokia or Nokia, whatever it's called, phone, and it had nibbles on it or whatever. Oh, yeah. You know, you know what I'm talking game. about? Snake. Yeah. That's what it was. I saw that getting played constantly yeah, snake for and like Bejeweled five pro- years. Are, are, might yeah, be contenders, yeah. but, I, but I feel like the sheer number of idle hours of desk drones not wanting to work at that's their Windows true. 3.1 <laughs> PCs, that's you know, Windows true. 95, like there's this institutionalized old people solitaire playing for just hours as they sit at their security desk and, yeah. you know, do nothing. Well, and also, like, yeah. those Windows games were the three Windows games or the two Windows. Like, sometimes you didn't get free cell. I don't know what the, like how, what conditions led to that or what versions of Windows had it and didn't. But, like, Solitaire and Minesweeper, those have been on every desktop computer that everyone's ever had that ran Windows, which is most of them, uh, since, like, the early 90s or earlier. And they're still there now. Like, like they, you know, they, you've, they've had, like, what, 25 years at least yeah, they're they're on your work <laughs> computer is the key right so, yeah of course you can put whatever games you want but on your work computer there's nothing except though and especially before the web the web has really hurt that because now you can just go look at porn right, right. so that, that's probably <laughs> sucking a lot of time away from you know for the for the people sitting at desks being bored well, but the content filter won't know that you're using web. minesweeper yeah i don't i want i have to wonder i wish i wish microsoft had put monitoring and all stuff so you can calculate the sheer number of hours <laughs> that is spent <laughs> that people have spent playing these games <laughs> Minesweeper does not translate well to touch, by the way. I, I downloaded one for the iPad for like for my most recent flight somewhere, and I remember trying it out, and uh, the problem is, like, the difference between flagging a square and opening it, which is a really, really important thing you to just, not you do touch wrong. With your right, you got to touch with your right hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> right hand, and then, yeah. Like, it even, it had, it had, like, you could set it so that double tap was one of them, and one of them was, like, tap and hold. But, like, if you mess up once... You yeah. blow up a bomb and your game's over. So even casual games can't be touchscreen only. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Minesweeper doesn't. Well, like, for a long time, two of the biggest casual games were Minesweeper and Tetris. And neither of those work on touch. I, I'm a huge <laughs> Tetris fan, and it does not work on yeah. touch. Yeah. But, you know, but that, that's not to say that there aren't awesome casual games that I yeah, no, they, can have just as much time have- with. Yeah, mm-hmm. touchscreens have done a Nintendo type move where there was types of games that were not possible without a touchscreen. Right, and suddenly the whole world of them has opened up. So kudos for Apple for that, but clearly that was not like that's a side effect of them making a touchscreen interface. You know, and I, mm. I really do believe that they they are making their hardware like they want. Who wants the GPU? It's all about game people. So they were in consultation with like all those other guys oh, sure. about their gaming stack. And the, but but that's as far as it goes. We'll give you a great GPU. We'll give you a great screen. Uh, it, don't ask us for anything else. Well, don't ask us for but also, you know, they give them buttons. a lot of good APIs. Like, making games for iOS uh, is way better of a business and way better for the programmers than making games for Android. And and Apple knows this. And, and I think Apple tries to stay ahead of this as much as they can. Like, Apple's devices consistently have really good GPUs. Like, there's a lot of Android devices sold that are really lopsided. They have they have fast CPUs, really high-resolution screens, and really terrible GPUs um, because it's harder to really advertise that it's, or it's harder to get it right or more expensive. Uh, so, but, like, Apple does so well with, with having all their devices being able to play really great games. And there are not being that many GPUs out there, so it's, it's easy to program for all the Apple devices. 
and yeah, so and they know that early on was out because they had an open gl accelerated gui right. so kind of they needed that anyway right and and apple apple knows very much that gaming is extremely important to attract and keep people on their platform especially young people and, i mean the whole ipod touch was so focused on gaming for so long because of that like because they knew that it was a, a whole lot of ipod touch owners are like kids and teenagers who their parents don't want to buy them iphones yet and so they have ipod touches and uh and you know games are really important in those markets, so like they they really do focus quite a lot on games. It makes me sad when I see like a lot of my friends and relatives, without my consultation or blessing, have decided they're going to buy their children or significant others Kindle Fires. Oh God! And, I, and then and then I go and I that's Fire <laughs> HDs, and then I go and I see the kids playing games on a Kindle Fire. There's nothing sadder <laughs> than a kid playing a game on a Kindle Fire. <laughs> And I'm not saying this to sound like elitist, but like the Kindle Fire is not a gaming machine. Like, get your kid a Nintendo DS. Like, it, it will cost you less money, and that kid will have so much more fun. Yeah, you know, I, not, I bet a lot of Kindle Fires were bought for kids, thinking they'd be good gaming machines. I mean, because it makes sense. Like, angry birds on them. That's what you want. Like things, but it's just like you—you you want a cheap, a, a cheap solution to your kid's desire for an iPad. You know, like yeah. something where, like, if they if they break it or lose it, you know, you can be out. 160 bucks instead of 500 bucks like that that's yeah. a way more attractive thing for parents i'm sure but yeah man because the kindle fire I, I haven't used any of the new generation ones but the the first generation one that i have is is a, a terrible device in every possible way i mean it's it's like it's like when you're, when you're just a big fan of coke and your parents buy you like a case of rc cola right. and you're like no i know it seems like the same thing <laughs> like there are no redeeming factors to the kindle fire one it it's just so so bad. It wasn't even cheap enough to make it worth being this bad. Yeah. <laughs> so parents buy your kids Nintendo DS, please. It's not that much money. You can get it used old one, <laughs> not the 3DS. Don't even spring for the fancy. That one's too expensive. Just an old <laughs> Nintendo DS. It's indestructible. It has a bazillion awesome games that, that are fun. <laughs> that the frame rates are good on. Uh, it's not a tablet, but yeah. I think once your kid is is able to start caring about the frame rate, then maybe then maybe upgrade to an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because the, the games I would rather play a DS game. Like it's got it's got buttons, it's got buttons and a D pad, and you yeah, can draw I guess the screen. And, if I had to pick yeah. a platform to play Tetris on, I'd rather play Tetris on the DS than on, than yes, on. Yes, of course you you can actually. I mean, the Game Boy was the original, uh, you know, Tetris monster machine for kids. Oh yeah, and the parents were playing it on their on their PCs, but the kids in the back of the car with the Game Boy with the Gigantic Game Boy with the, you know, not black and white, but kind of yellowish, greenish and, and black. Oh, those were the days. Playing Tetris, that, you know, and Tetris, it was practically a Tetris machine. Oh, yeah, because any game with a scrolling background, like a platformer, just smeared so badly on that screen, yeah. you couldn't even play <laughs> yeah. it. Just like the original Game Gear had the exact same problem. Oh, the Game Gear well, was that... terrible. Every, everything about the game batteries. Used, yes, it, it used six AA batteries at a time, and it used them up in five minutes. And yeah, it, yep. it, <laughs> I think it would burn through six batteries in like forty-five minutes or an hour. It was it was a pretty short yeah, it, time. It would last you a lunch period in middle school. That's my gauge for how right. long those things would last. It was like, well, you could bring it to lunch, and I don't want to turn it on to lunch, and then you all, all your friends would play at lunch, and by the end of lunch, well, the batteries are dying now. Yeah, and, and so you'd have to have like these tremendous rechargeable battery pack accessories or any. Yeah, and they were NICAD, not even nickel metal yep, hydride. Exactly. Like, terrible, terrible memory effect on them. Oh, was... yeah. Because the I don't appreciate lithium ion, let me tell you. <laughs> well, and, like, people with Game Boys have to have those big light things on, on the front, like those big, those big like, light yeah, magnifying yeah, yeah. glass combo accessories. <laughs> yeah. With stereo speakers. Yes, yes. That? <laughs> That's what you missed out on, too, by not being a Mac user. Uh, so the, the original Mac. Uh, non-desktop machine, let's call it, uh, <laughs> called the Mac Portable. Uh, it had a lead-acid battery, like the oh kind my God. in your car. Okay? <laughs> it weighed 16 pounds, I believe. I have one in my attic. It weighed 16 pounds. It had a full-size, actual, real keyboard. Because it's 16 pounds, why the hell not, right? right? Uh, and so it's like, this is a laughing stock. I don't have like a trackball embedded in for, for movement. This is a laughing stock type of thing. Like, Ooh, this is a ridiculous machine. But you know what it had? It had something that you kids might know the name of called an Active Matrix LCD screen. And that meant when you move stuff, the <laughs> screen updated. And it was like a miracle. It was like a miracle because we'd all seen the smeary LCD screens. Like, LCD screens, those are terrible. And once you saw this thing, you're like, wait a second. It doesn't smear. You know, it was, I mean, I probably look at it now. It would probably look like a ghosting mess. But it was 
active matrix versus, you know, the passive matrix displays that you saw. It was such a night and day and experience. It was like, this is what I want from Apple. I don't care that it's 16 pounds. I don't care that it's a lead-acid battery. I don't care that it's this gigantic beast with a handle. The screen is amazing, you know. Uh, that's That was the old Apple. There was always something something phenomenal about even their worst machines. Did you, uh, in, in the Mac uh, universe back then, did you guys ever have uh, mouse pointer trails? Uh, intentionally or unintentionally? Because the, the crappy, <laughs> you know, the, the first power books, uh, uh, did they all have active matrix? I think it may have only been an option. I remember, I remember mouse cursor trails on bad laptops for years. It was, but... it was actually a feature of Windows. Uh, I think yeah, in 3.1 they added it. It was a feature where it would, it would just draw, it would leave the mouse pointer graphic, it would not unblit it. It would draw it on the screen uh, in the shadows. So, like, it's very similar to when Windows uh, freezes. And <laughs> but it happening or, all the time. Like, when, when a window blocks its uh, main event loop, whatever, I forget what it's called on Windows, but w- when it doesn't respond to its main event loop and it doesn't respond to repainting events, um, so everything just kind of smears all over the window because it's not... I don't, is this still true in Windows 7 and 8 that it's the windows aren't their own layers anymore? Or like, no, are they, they their own window, layers? Windows, windows 7 Arrow has a compositing window manager. Oh, good, finally. Okay, because I know... Bef- <laughs> like, you can turn it off, though, because it's Windows. Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like it, it, the screens were so bad back then, they actually added artificial mouse trails to make it easier to see where your mouse pointer yeah, was to, to find where it is. And that's actually that's actually kind of an accessibility thing. Like my my mother uh, uses the crank up the size of the cursor thing because mm-hmm. her vision is going right, uh, and so that because she can't otherwise she forgets where the cursor is and you can't see it. Like you wiggle it around trying to get the motion. Well, if you've got trails and you wiggle it around, all of a sudden there's this white swirl happening off in the corner. You're like, oh, there's the cursor. So, Marco, can I ask you about the magazine? Yeah. So, you had tweeted earlier today, which, if this gets released by the time anyone uh, hears it, it's going to be like a week ago. But anyway, you had tweeted that you had added support for other mail clients other than Apple Mail. And it got me to thinking, and uh, I'm probably not looking at this right, but I wanted to hear your guys' take. It got me to thinking that to some degree... I feel like that sort of developer effort uh, that you had to go through to support all these other mail clients, which I'm, I'm assuming is just a series of URL schemes. Is that yeah. correct? And it wasn't so all it, these it, other. I, I literally just added support for Gmail and Sparrow because I can't. Nobody told me any other client that they're using except for that new uh, mailbox thing. But they don't have a URL scheme, so I can't do anything with it. Right, but it it still got me to thinking that that almost smells to me like the iOS equivalent of the Android fragmentation in the sense that it's something that's not well managed by well i mean URL schemes are well managed by the OS no, they're but, not. but they're well, really really okay. not it's, it's the wild west out there they're, they don't even well, have a registry right. like they did for type creator codes you know okay so that's fair but what i'm driving at is there's a mechanism for quasi you know interact communication but but really that that is a hack to me that you shouldn't have to go through and i don't think it's apple style to let you pick a different mail client or at least not an ios but that just kind of smells like what do you i was curious what you guys thought about that yeah, they don't like letting you pick a different mail client but uh well see you I... know avent- eventually like i mean think think about the mac how how they don't really like letting you pick your different default browser like remember when right. there was the internet config control panel where you said what what application do you want to use for the ftp protocol what application do you want to use for and like you got to pick it but then like you know what Let's just put that as a preference in Safari. And then every stupid web browser had to say, no, I'm the default browser. No, right. I'm. And you'd have to go to the app itself to change that setting. Like there was no system wide. Right. There still is a system wide registry and database of who control, but it's not exposed. And, and that's the Mac where it's supposed to be the Wild West. On iOS, it's like, so you want to use a different default mail client? Well, screw you. Like that's why when, <laughs> when I went to the magazine and I saw, oh, it wants me to send an email. And the only email account I have configured on my Mac is not one of the ones that I would want to use from a web browser. So now, like, I basically, I couldn't, you know, I don't have, I, I use the Gmail app. This is, I guess, before you added uh, Gmail support or whatever. But it's like, anytime I see anything that's sending email on iOS, my heart drops because I'm like, oh, well, that's not using, <laughs> that's not, that's not, I have, I have one really obscure account configured to mail and I never look at it. And I don't want to send from that account. And it's not my real account. And it's not like my Apple ID account. And it's not, it just it just depresses me all because I deign to use a different email client. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a mess. That whole world is a mess. But I, I think Gmail is probably the only real exception where there's actually demand that matters to Apple. Like I, I don't like on the Mac when when a lot of this Mac stuff was designed, uh, like you know the early days of of Mail and Safari. 
um, Mel and Safari sucked. And, and in well, many ways, Safari that, Apple, still Apple sucks. Didn't, Apple didn't have a mail client, and Apple didn't have right. a web browser when this stuff was done on classic macOS. Like, of course they're going to let you pick what your what the default application for email is, because Apple didn't even have a horse in the game. It's not like they had a Claris email, or I guess, right. but, you know, loosely affiliated, but they sure didn't have a web browser. It was like, do you want to use IE as your default web browser, or Netscape, you know, or, uh, or iCab, or CyberDog? I guess they had CyberDog, too. <laughs> you know, like, we keep going back. But, like, that underpinning, like, if you were designing an OS, like, I'm going to be an awesome OS and I'm going to support third-party development, of course you have to have a system by which the user gets to choose which of these umpteen third-party applications they want to serve these particular needs. But then once Apple has a horse in the game, like, it simplifies things greatly so you don't have to shop around. Like, Apple gives you something, everything works out of the box and you're fine. But God forbid you are a slightly advanced user and say, you know what, I believe I'll use a different mail client. It's like, whoa, 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 hold up, what are you doing here, you know? And on Mac, on the Mac, you can figure out how to do it, but a normal person can't. Like, if if my parents decided that they wanted to use a different mail client, which they probably never would, but if they did, they would have no idea how to do that. They would never think to look in the, in the preferences for the mail client that they, you know, in either mail client, they wouldn't think to look for the preferences to tell the OS that they want. Well, it would it would do what the browsers client. do, which is all the third party ones would have <sighs> would have a, a nag yeah. screen that would pop up saying, "Hey, you want to set this as the default?" Um, yeah. But I, you know, I, but I think like on iOS, just like because because iOS launched with the best browser and mail client available on iOS, and the and, only and, and it, <laughs> well, mail client. well, but now it's now I would say Mail and Safari are still the best mail well, client Sa- and browser Safari is available the best on the platform. because they won't let anyone else use Nitro JavaScript engine. So duh, no wonder it's the best. Like you know, for safety reasons and whatever. Like they have legitimate security reasons for not allowing that to happen. But everyone else's hands are tied behind their back. So no one is ever going to make a better browser than Safari in terms of performance and web rendering because they're the only guys who get to use the good rendering engine. They're the good JavaScript engine. Anyway. I wouldn't... And it, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, I mean, Safari's JavaScript is faster than everyone else's on iOS, but yeah. that does... But, like, I don't think... I don't think that's what's holding back the other browsers, honestly. Does, you're, not allow, you're not allowed to use a Java... Like, that's why... Doesn't the Chrome uh, use, uh, use WebKit yeah. on, uh, on iOS entirely, including it the JavaScript to, engine? Yeah. Un- unlike Chrome on the Mac, which uses the V8 JavaScript, because you're not allowed to make an interpreter. That's their other thing. You can't use... Oh, yeah. Unless, yeah. You're, and, game, and that's, unless you're a game maker and you get grandfathered right. in or whatever the hell crazy stu- deal they have with EA to let them run Lua scripts or whatever. I think that you doesn't matter. You can't make an interpreter. Well, they, they uh, changed the interpretation of that rule like a year ago to be... <laughs> To be more, even more vague and unspecified, but more sensible most of the time. But yeah, but, but still, still, I mean, it it's... still boxes out JavaScript engines. Like oh sure, clearly. Oh, you're you're making a language, and we don't want you to download download code from the internet and execute it. You know, so you have to use our JavaScript engine and the slow version of our JavaScript engine that doesn't have all these security, you know, possibly security violating features. So no one is going to ever make a browser that's going to be universally better than Safari. Uh, and then Mail, I would say that lots of people would say that people already have made better clients than mail i don't know how if you like this mailbox crazy thing which has other server side and security and privacy concerns to it but client wise like it's an innovation in terms of how you deal with your mail and i really like that innovation i just don't like everything else about the client which is why i'm not going to get it uh but they have a chance to there is a chance that someone could make a better ios native mail client than apple because there's no technical reason holding them back the only thing that screws you is that well so what no other application is going to see your stupid mail thing, and when you send mail, we're going to still pull up Apple Mail because that's the way it works. Right. So, do you ever think that will change? I mean, I no. don't. I don't. I, I don't ever will, see but... there being enough demand from customers. Honestly, like Gmail, maybe Chrome, no. Uh, I I just don't see there being this massive demand from customers on iOS to want well, to use alternative what, clients enough for Apple to want to change their minds on the policy. Like, if there was huge demand, happen, that'd be different. I think long term, what's going to happen is that, uh, as in so many things, there's going to be a new killer application, either category or individual instance, that wants to fill the role that's currently filled by a default Apple application. Uh, And in order to be competitive, there will be public pressure to say, hey, why can't I use popular new thing instead of the dumb default thing that comes? And that will only happen, not because of anything that Apple's doing, but because of the sheer mind share and and sort of cultural traction that this other thing gets. They dodged the bullet on Twitter for that because it was always third party and they didn't have a single horse in the game, right? And they integrated Twitter into the US. But I don't know what the next thing is, but whatever it is, if it wants to take over like web browsing or mail sending and becomes wildly popular independent of Apple, Apple will be under pressure from that same casual public 
to how come every time I send mail on, on my iPhone, it brings up the stupid mail application. I want to send hollow mail with the new holographic hollow whatever thing that's made by third party company that's not Apple. And they have an app, but every time I send mail, like that's the phenomenon I'm looking for. Where it's going to be something that becomes popular, independent of Apple, that they can't be ignored, uh, and they're just going to be forced to say, you know, all right, we. We've now have a way for you to choose which application you want to send mail. Do you want our boring other one or this crazy holo mail that everyone loves? Or I'm mispronouncing holo, but whatever. Maybe, maybe what it would actually take would be uh, a, one of those killer apps getting huge and you know taking over, growing really fast, like like Instagram levels of growth, just taking over like crazy, but on Android instead, and not even being well, like, available on yeah. iOS because well, that, it can't exist be in the App Store. Because th- they would say, on my iPhone, the stupid Apple app always comes up, but on my Android phone, I get to pick which one I want, and everybody who has an Android phone automatically picks whatever crazy popular new thing is. And so everyone with an Android phone is happily going along and doing their thing, and the Apple people are like, yeah, we have this workaround where, like, most Apple... Like, the worst-case scenario is people have to do what Marco is doing. It's like, all right, like you tried to do with the magazine originally with the Chrome. Yeah, uh, and just automatically pick the right one. With Instapaper, like, oh, if you have Chrome installed, I want to. you're forced to do crap like that because you because the OS gives no way for people who want to use Chrome to indicate that preference. You're like, well, right. well if they have it installed. I like, shouldn't, I shouldn't to have to do this at all. The, the, there should be yeah, absolutely no reason why an app developer should need, to, should need to separately code support for different mail clients or different browsers. I shouldn't yeah, even have to know you, what browsers are out there. Yeah, it's like, and every application is going to have to have this stupid proliferation of preferences and dealing with right. URL protocols because, and it just makes a mess. And that's like the worst thing that could happen to Apple is that something becomes wildly popular. Apple refuses to budge. Every application that does anything that involves this application suddenly adds a preference that says, use Apple default, use this one or whatever. And then every time you download a new application, you got to go into settings and change it and say, oh, I got to tell this to use my... I mean, like, Fantastic Cal is kind of almost there because they want to make a default calendar, but they can't replace the default calendar. Like, there's a lot of people, I bet, who would buy an iOS calendar application completely replacing the existing calendar if they could, you know? Yeah, I, w- I would do that with Fantastic Cal, absolutely. And actually, you were talking about something that's only on Android that isn't on iOS, and this isn't a great example, but but one that jumped to mind was the swipe keyboard thing yeah. that, that all the Android users rave about. And I don't think it's popular enough to, to get the response from Apple that you're talking about, John. But that certainly is something that I think of that that Android users can hold over our heads and say, hey, look what we can do, and you can't without like a jailbreak yeah, or something like that. There's a limit to what Apple will do. Like Letting you pick your favorite email application is within the realm of what I would consider plausible for Apple to do in the future. Yeah, yeah. But letting you pick like a different app instead of Springboard is outside that realm. You know? right. Or a different keyboard, like a, like a third-party keyboard app, that is just... Like, they don't even let you do it on the Mac. Like, that's a good yardstick is the question. Like, do they let you replace the Finder with another app? No. Like, yeah, you can hack it up and, and you know, figure out a way to do it because it's the Mac and it's much more open than iOS. But they don't offer you that option. You can pick your default browser and you can pick your default mail client and you can pick which application automatically has ownership over, you know, .shtml files or whatever the hell you want. But you cannot pick through, like, a GUI interface. You know what? I'm not into the Finder. Can you can you launch into Pathfinder and still? It's up to the Pathfinder devs to figure out how to hack your system up to make that happen. So keyboards, probably outside the realm of uh, of possibility in the, the near or distant future. Springboard replacement, also probably not going to happen. Oh, yeah, it's never going to happen. Apple's way. But replacement mail and browsers, uh, could, I mean, maybe not mail, maybe not browsers, maybe not calendar, but something along those lines. Like camera apps may be... Yeah, you know, like See, but it's like there, the, there there aren't that many types of apps like that 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 they're that the use case is else, yeah. is so compelling to replace the default apps. Like there really yeah. there aren't really aren't a lot of categories like that, and, and that's why I think like like calendar is a great example of one of those categories. But I think the demand for that is even lower than the than the demand for browsers. I would say demand for browsers is probably the lowest because Chrome and iOS is not that much better than Safari and iOS. Demand is probably highest for email clients because everyone wants to use the Gmail app. I think that that is probably the, the, the strongest case for this preference existing. Um, calendars, I don't think, you know, I think the market for alternative calendars, it, while it may be big enough to support a few developers doing it, I don't think it's big enough for Apple to, to have to care about, about having a default setting. Well, I don't know, like calendars, reminders, to-do lists, like there are tons of third-party things that people like, like the defaults are, well, I think a lot of people ignore the defaults because the third-party market is so rich for those things, especially right. with like, you know, th- they were ahead of Apple on integrating with a Mac client and an iPad and iPhone all together with one big shared thing, you know what I mean? Uh, it's just that they're not so much launched from other applications. Like what you don't want is for people to be in 
a cool app and see that they're about to do some activity that's going to invoke another app and realize with a sinking feeling that, oh, this is not going to invoke the app that I want, right? And that repeatedly happening to people uh, is what makes people sad. I guess it happens the most, I guess, by sending email because, you know, it's not done from a sheet like a tweet might be with that API or whatever. It's they send you off to the to the mail app to send your email uh, and you don't let you don't end up in the Gmail app or whatever your you, the app that you wanted to use was. I mean, Apple Apple can nip this in the butt. Like the reason we hated it so much with browsers, you know, because Microsoft stagnated on IE and they said we're we're just not going to develop that anymore. IE six is perfect and it never needs to be changed ever again. And it, the gap just widened and, and became increasingly crazy. If, imagine if if Windows users could not change their default browser at all. But had to like explicitly like copy and paste right. the URL, launch launch Netscape back in the day, and paste the URL in. You know, uh, that's that's like what the situation is like on iOS now. If you want to use something different for your mail or browser, yeah, you're right. You're like, oh, there's there's a link. Oh, but I don't want to tap it. And, you know. Well, that's that's sort of true. Um, on the new version of one or newish version of one password, they did something absolutely brilliant, which was they made their URL handlers. Um, op http and op https so the premise is if you're in safari and you want to open that site that you're looking at in one password it is fiddly admittedly but it's as unfiddly as you can be which is to say you go to the url bar and you put the letters op in front of whatever the crap is there and then it'll kick over to one password and open it up they had to make their own browsers what they had to do (laughs) Uh, yeah yeah you're absolutely right that's that's like that is so i don't know if it's terrible but it's like you're one password and you want to provide password management services and the only way you can do it is like i've just got to, i've just got to make the whole new browser it's great that they can do it with a nice embeddable web kit control and everything like that but it's like that's the heavyweight solution oh, yeah. actually don't even yeah. don't even browse the web from that browse the web from our thing because this is one little thing that we want to do in some cases and we can't do it unless you do unless you're literally using our software oh, yeah. i have that exact same thing with instapaper which is i wanted to add an easy read later button because mobile safari makes that so hard to do uh, that I built a whole web browser into Instapaper so that people could browse the web and save stuff from it if they couldn't figure out how to install the bookmarklet. And you should you should never remove that feature. By the way, I'm going to come. I'll hunt you down. I, well, and I I would Instapaper. love I would love to remove that feature. I I would no, so love I, to. I like to I like to bring up the the <laughs> full version of the web page without leaving the app. That's my like common use case. I would love to remove it, but I probably never can uh, because I'd of be because of things like that, because there's enough people who use it, but also because there's going to be so many people who who just browse from never that. never figure out how to do the bookmark. Like, right, do, yeah. because I can't I mean, do anything. I, I figured out the bookmark. Like, I have it, but it's just, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, and I think, you. like, a, a system like Windows 8's contracts uh, would really go a long way towards solving a lot of these issues. Not all of them. There would still be some issues, but, you know, if... If if Apple broadens this whole uh, UI activity thing from iOS six uh, and combining with the remote view controllers thing uh, that they quietly added to iOS six as well and use behind the scenes, if they if they transform this into something like Windows eight contracts uh, with iOS seven, maybe if if they but does did that this, really it, help? it would be a, well, it would be a tremendous help if they did it that way. Right now, its current implementation on iOS six, it's it's really extremely unhelpful in many ways. Um, where like, you know, for me to for me to add the send to Instapaper button in the magazine, I had to manually code that into the magazine, provide an icon for it, write all the code to log into Instapaper to save it, all that stuff. Um, even though I had the Instapaper app installed, uh, if I wanted it to be in the app without kicking over the Instapaper app and then kicking back, which is you know kind of uh, inelegant. Um, if I wanted it to all be in the app, I had to write that all myself. There's no way Instapaper could offer to the magazine its own like interface that could be in the magazine share panel. That that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, if that did least, exist, that, sh- that, sh- that share panel will open up almost guaranteed in iOS seven. Like you will be able to put stuff. I in that really share panel hope so. But th- but that's a major I, I that's a major architectural change though. Like that and that that's why it's it's a big deal if they do it, and it might not happen yet because it is such a major change. But that would like that would that's that's part of what Windows 8 contracts are. That would go a long way towards solving a lot of these problems. If I could just if I could just say, here I have I have this this item to share. Open up a share panel, and I can offer you a URL, a file of this type, and this text. And any apps that can do something with these things can show up here and do their thing. And I don't have to code all that myself. That would go a long way. 
Yeah, is the is the remote view controller stuff the stuff that's using XPC that's actually in iOS six but not you know not public? Yes, it's it the thing that spawns the external process and communicates with it through like a secure sandbox channel. Exactly. All that business. Yeah, it's it's yeah. U- it's currently used for the mail sharing controller, and I think maybe even the Twitter one and the Facebook the, the one, but thing, definitely yeah. the mail one uses it, and and uh, like that's they could definitely use that exact same kind of system. To, to do this for all third party apps and have this kind of system. And but, but the share sheet is different. The share sheet is literally what you said. It was just it's just a question of querying which applications can handle this type of thing, showing their stupid icons and feeding them the data, you know, with a with a with a launch event, you know. Like like add to Instapaper, you'd be perfectly happy if the add to Instapaper was hit the share button, hit the little inst- the little i Instapaper icon, your application gets like all you need is a freaking URL. Like your, your application gets the URL and can has a chance to shove it in somewhere and then you know it goes away. Well, but but then but the question of, is like, do you does my app does it switch to my app first? Because that's kind of, that's kind of inelegant. Or is my yeah, app like, is my app just brought up in a background state and I present a view controller that the remote controller then displays. And then I'm just handing oh, this yeah, data, yeah, yeah. and then and my app never shows up. That would be the right uh, way to do it. Uh, uh, the, 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 share, the share thing with the list of icons, I assume, is going to launch you. The, the remote view controller thing where you get to present an interface is what you really want, but that's you know more complicated. But like anytime there's a private API like that used by Apple apps that you know – like XPC is public API on the Mac, right? So this is kind of one of those things where it seems like it's this – is, this is how uh, – this is how a public API, uh, private API becomes public. It's like how a bill becomes a law, how a baby is made. First, Apple uses it. In all, <laughs> it first, Apple uses it in all their apps, uh, and then they hopefully wring the bugs out of it. And then the next release, they open it up to everyone. Or in the next release, they decide they made a terrible mistake, scrap it, and start over again. Right. Uh, but well, X, only- but XPC is already public on the Mac, so I feel pretty good about that. The only problem I have with this idea is let's take in in the example of the ma- of the magazine. What what I don't really see how this would help in the sense that what you're doing is you're doing something with a URL. So if you have a share sheet and you're presenting to the, to the share sheet, hey, I've got a URL. Who can do something with this? That's going to be half the damn apps on your iPhone or iPad or whatever the case may be. Well, that, that's, and, that's why they don't do it because everyone's like, I register for Star. I can exactly. handle any data. Just well, and that, that actually – like there's, um, there was a, a good interview from uh, Chapone on uh, – on Debug, the podcast by uh, Rene Ritchie and Guy uh, English. Um, you know Chapone, the, the hacker guy? Anyway, Grant Paul. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, he was talking on their show about uh, how this is a problem on Android that, that does implement this feature because then the, you have these apps that show these giant long lists of what you can do with something, and they're kind of they're not really ordered in any, any good way. You can't really set like a default of what you want to show up on top for certain types. Like it, that actually then becomes a pretty challenging interface problem. Yeah, they're going to do the thing like where you hold down on the icon and they wiggle, and you can X them out, and there's a more button at the bottom <laughs> if you want to get some back. Like you know, you're going to have to trim those lists because as soon as you do that, yeah, it'll like look at the freaking app store. It'll be Are used. Up the I don't know. Too. Well, first of all, they can they can police it, so they can say like, well, you know, you don't really have a use for this, so we're not going to let you register for mm, it. But s- some applications though, like have legit. Like, what if you're a text editor? Like anytime right. something is text, you're like, oh look, there's or any you know, whatever any of those there's like, elements, there's elements again, or a PDF reader or something. Yeah, like Good Reader and Dropbox will just register for every file type, or or an image. Like all your camera apps are going to show up, all your image <laughs> retouching apps. Like it's just you'll want you'll want to uh, the interface problem is you'll want to it's either going to have to be opt in, which would be kind of annoying for regular users, or opt out where you just you know use the the gesture that we all know to make icons go away, which is hold your finger down on them, hit the little X. And then you know, trim the list. Maybe that will be, or it'll it'll just reorder itself app. when, like you know, wh- whichever one you use last will move up to the front of the list. Oh no, that's that's no good. That's the re- there's a reason Springboard doesn't work that way because it would drive people nuts. Yeah, <laughs> upper left is Safari. Where did it go? I haven't used it recently. <laughs> yeah, you just you're the muscle memory of like that sheet comes up. Instapaper is top left corner. You tap it. If Instapaper is not the top left corner because you didn't use it or use a different one last time, yeah, that's angry making. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I agree, and and that's what I'm driving at is that RPC definitely solves a problem, which is if you're Marco and you want to have a native Instapaper share function from within the magazine, you're right now you're screwed, and RPC would fix that. But that to me, it doesn't really fix the problem of I have a URL I wish to email. What can email this URL? Because it's more than just having a URL you want to share or do something with. You want you want to be able to say that my intention is to email it. And then that calls the list down to whatever email clients you have 
or perhaps if Apple was nuts yeah. and, and had a default email client setting, then it then that is what you get. Yeah, it wouldn't. That's the Android intent. So it wouldn't just be a protocol driven. It would be action. Exactly. It would, it would, have, it would have to have uh, action. Would have to be a component. We we're just saying protocol driven for like if you have raw data, kind of like you know who can handle this pasteboard data type of thing. Right. But yeah. There's also the intention is like I would like you know who who is an email like Apple could just Apple can define these things. I was saying in another podcast a while ago. If Apple wants to allow third-party email applications, by all means, let it say, look, if you want to be a third-party email application that participates in the system we're defining, here's how you must behave in terms of RPC. Here's the features you have to uh, support. You must support attachments, custom subject lines, two is from, like, so you can, like, conform to some protocol that I'm sure Apple's mail application already totally conforms to or whatever. Like, define it however you want. People will jump through those hoops to be like... You know, so so basically, so you don't run to the problem of like, oh, well, you picked a third party email application that can't handle subject lines for some reason, and my application doesn't work because it puts some code in the subject line, and you know what I mean? Like that's what they want to avoid. Like, oh, you because because you're not using the default email application, your stuff broke. Uh, so they would have to say, if you want to be a replacement for a system thing, you must support these features, this protocol. You know, just screw it down as tight as you want because people will jump through it to be in that, and that will solve the consistency problem of being afraid everything was working fine but because he was a third-party email app- application something broke you know right and that's a huge support problem for developers when that start that stuff starts getting possible like right now i mean and that's kind of the flip side of this like right now i because i'm building in support for all these things manually i can test them all and i can be pretty sure that the options that everybody that anybody will ever see will all work um, but once you start integrating these other things then people will start blaming you for like, oh, when I shared to new experimental browser X um, from your share panel, it didn't work right in this weird way. And they'll email me saying it's my fault. Yeah, I just had that with with the hypercritical, hypercritical.co podcast feed. Ever since that site went up, people are like, I tried to subscribe to your feed in Reader and it showed me this crazy ass thing. And they show me like a sheet in Reader that shows a huge list of things, none of which are my feed, <laughs> some of which have my name related to them. Like, what the hell? I'm like, that must be running a search or something. What the hell is it doing? And, and, you, and you're like, look, it's it's a URL. It's HTTP colon slash slash, and it has a bunch of stuff. You click it, and, like, this is on the Mac. So it activates, okay, what is your handler for RSS? I guess it looks at the MIME type of the, of the thing coming back, yep. you know, Atom feed or whatever. And, and then it launches your preferred newsreader application, which happens to your readers in these people's systems. And then reader gets it. Uh, and it turns out what Safari does is it takes off the HTTP, puts in feed colon slash slash, uh, f- finds out whatever the default protocol f- handle is for feed, basically what is your newsreader, uh, launches that, at, at, but gives it that URL, and I believe... It excises the feed at that point and hands the URL without the leading HTTP or something. But it, what it comes down to is that what, re- what Reader was doing is taking the URL as it was given, with, which no longer had... Oh, no, I think it was stripping off the feed. R- Reader was stripping off the feed colon slash slash, not putting HTTP slash slash back on, <laughs> feeding that to the Google, Google Reader API, and Google Reader API inter- interpreted that as a search term and not a URL, and hilarity ensues. <laughs> God. And that is a pretty... <laughs> that is like... Like how co- how complicated is that? It's a link that you click that launches a protocol handle. You know what I mean? Like it's that's as simple as it could possibly be, and yet it still went totally awry. Like once it went off to the third party application, it's like, oh yeah, I'm totally compliant. I handle feed URLs, but then what it does with them, it passes them to Google Reader, and Google Reader does something crazy with it, and then so you get into a situation where you're like, hey, I tried to subscribe to your news feed, but when I clicked on it, because the news reader I used isn't whatever news reader you tested with something crazy happened so i guess no matter how simple you make it something can go wrong that you did not expect yep it, this bug is fixed in the next version of reader supposedly <laughs> right that'd be, then it'll introduce five more yeah i'll be happy like the results were i don't know why google reader is doing this i'm assuming it's because they don't think dot co is like a is like a real extension they're probably looking for the dot com to like you know doing their fuzzy matching is this a url it's kind of odd i don't know yeah but the search terms that come up are vaguely related to me because this got the word hypercritical <laughs> and feed and main and so you think you see things about the podcast and my name and yeah took me a while to figure that one out <laughs>